good day students i hope you have uh, already known some specific groups of microbiology like we've talked about uh, bacteria we've talked about fungi we've talked about algae viruses in the soil system and now we're going to talk about and fauna of course uh, now we're going to talk about how does these different groups of uh, microbiota interact among themselves and interact among each other and other groups of um, microbes and other uh, um, organisms in the soil environment. So when we talk about microbial ecology, it, we're, it's not an easy or well-defined uh, because of the complexity of the different interactions. So one professor here defines it as a branch of biology that entirely abandoned to terminology or the art of talking about what everybody already knows in a language that nobody understands. So this is to give you a little bit about how microbial ecology is the art of talking about what nobody really knows in a language that everybody pretends to understand. So when we talk about environment, it is a very complex system and uh, there are different key players that control how individuals and how uh, different groups interact within and among themselves. So this is just a, an illustration just showing you the um, soil with the uh, soil particles in here and you also have some fauna and we have some parasites and protozoa there are some fungal hyphae over here extending over here there's a root system coming out from here and so there's a, a, a multitude of different organisms bacteria perhaps feeding and amoeba and different types of groups how do they interact where do they, how do they live together in certain habitats and uh, uh, what key functions do they do and how does that affect their environment and their surroundings. So um, again, here's another um, example where there are different arrows moving from one place to another uh, showing how, for example, plant material, for example, here, and they have the shoot, and there's a root, and how is that linked with the other factors like bacteria, fungi, uh, vascular or vascular mycorrhizae, nematodes, and uh, different parts of key players do several functions. Here we talk to another, an, another level where we have the fauna and the mites and the fungivores and uh, bacterial nematodes. So uh, different key players, there are different relationships and it seems so complex. Okay, but let's try to simplify all these interactions in this table and we'll give examples later on. For, so for example, the first interaction that we're going to talk about today is the neutralism. Neutralism, here we have two organisms, A and B. And in these two organisms, if there's no uh, interrelationship among them, if A is present, uh, not affecting B in any way, and if B is present without affecting uh, organism A in any way, then we call tend to call this a neutralistic relationship where there's no gain, no loss in the relationship, and we tend to give it uh, a notion of zero, so it indicating that there is no interaction between organism A and organism B. As for the second relationship, which is the commensalism, here we note that there is a positive, uh, uh, a positive relationship for organism A, where organism B does not is not affected with the presence of A. So a, B is neutral to A, but A benefits from the presence of organism B. And we will uh, get to some certain examples later on. So there's a positive, uh, it's a positive relationship for A and a neutral relationship for B. As for the uh, second, uh, the third, let's say, relationships, they are the synergism or mutualism or symbiosis. All three these 
relationships they are similar in a way that there is a positive relationship for um, the two organisms. They both benefit from each other. So organism A uh, gives a benefit to organism B, and so as B gives another benefit to organism A, and they both uh, um, depend on each other for, for growth and for reproduction or habitat and so on. Uh, that's opposite when we talk about competition, for example. Competition in this case is a negative-negative relationship. Okay, So uh, A is negatively affected by the presence of B, and B is also negatively affected by the presence of organism A. And here we're going to show also examples and show the criteria where competition would occur. Then, if we talk about amensalism, here there's a, a neutral uh, side for, let's say, organism A, but there's, on the other hand, there's a negative side to collaboration with organism B. So, if A is present, B doesn't like it. He's negatively affected by the presence of A. Okay? And that's uh, the final uh, the other microbe-microbe uh, interaction is the parasitism and predation. Let's talk about certain examples here. Well, if we talked about commensalism, if you remember. Commensalism, let's remember it in the uh, uh, previous slide. It's the relationship where one is um, not affected by the other while the other benefits from the presence of the other organism. For example, let's look at certain uh, uh, wood rot fungus. Okay? The fungi that has the ability to degrade woody materials, they have the ability to degrade cellulose, for example. And then they transfer um, cellulose to organic acids that could be useful for other microbes. So the cellulitic fungi is there, and it's doing its function in the environment without any regard to the presence of any bacteria, so it's neutral for the others. But because this fungi is there and it's working, it's degrading cellulose into organic acids that are simple it's for them so they can use and autolyze, then these bacteria benefit from that relationship. So it's a commensalistic example of uh, um, relationship. The other uh, example is the uh, factor in that we will see in, within the nitrification. In the nitrogen cycle, nitrification is an important step in utilizing uh, nitro uh, nitrogen uh, into transferring it to different sources that are uh, become more uh, available for plants and other microbes. For here, let's say there's this uh, NH4+, plus, the ammonium ion, is transferred to nitrite, NO2-, minus, by the activity of nitrosomonas bacteria. So that nitrosomonas is neutrally there. It is doing its function. It is converting ammonium ion to nitrite, okay? It doesn't matter whether nitrobacter is there or not there. It, it, it grows uh, with, by itself. It's not affected by nitrobacter. But nitrobacter, on the other hand, benefits from the presence of nitrosomonas in a way that it is preparing its substrate. It is preparing the NO2 minus, okay? And so the nitrobacter, as the nitrosomonas becomes active and they're preparing the nitride, the nitrobacter gets this nitride and transfer it into nitrate, NO3 minus, okay? And that's how nitrobacter has a positive correlation and uh, nitrosomonas here, it's a neutral correlation. So positive and zero here indicates a commensalistic type of relationship. And let's say the other uh, type, which is the synergism or the symbiosis. Here, there's a relationship, as you remember, there's a positive-positive interaction for both species. 
Uh, for example, in, when it comes to uh, synergism, we talk about microbial consortia who uh, benefit from each other by supporting different enzymes that are able to degrade, uh, um, for example, lignin or cellulosic material or any other material that they all share the benefit. But each uh, bacteria does a certain step. Or in the methane producing or sulfate reducing bacteria, you can also see the synergy between different groups of microorganisms. We'll get to that later when we talk about the element cycles. As for the symbiotic association, we've seen some uh, interesting examples. We've seen it between fungi and plants, as in case of mycorrhizae and the other uh, plants. We've seen it in examples like legume and rhizobia. The rhizobia is the uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria that inhabits or lives within uh, the root of uh, leguminous plants and they benefit each other. There's a plus-plus relationship here. Also, when it comes to termites and protozoa, the protozoa help the termites in uh, digesting some material and the termites then provides the uh, preliminary uh, food source. Also the lichens, if you remember lichens, is an example of a, a symbiotic association between fungi and algae. And so we call them the primary colonizers. So this is also an example of a symbiotic relationship with a benefit to both organisms. Uh, the amensalism, we said it's the opposite of commensalism, where there's a neutral side uh, to one of the organism, to one of the organisms, but the other organism is negatively affected. It is negatively affected by the presence of the first. So we could see this example in terms of toxic waste products, antibiotics, and biocontrol. Those organisms who secrete antibiotics or have biocontrol, they could negatively affect uh, the other organisms. Parasitism and predation. Here we've uh, seen some examples when it comes to bacteria and protozoa. Uh, the protozoa feeds on bacteria and they could rely on them immediately. Also the macrophages uh, and uh, Bidillo vibrio virus. Uh, and the nematode trapping fungi is also an example of a predation uh, fungi, predation type of feeding in fungi, which is rare to happen, but it is there. Okay. Now the competition is uh, an interesting story because most of the organisms in the soil environment they do some competition uh, over limited resource. To have competition, we demand two factors. First, two or more organisms should be available in, uh, in a certain location, and they are competing for a condition or for a material that is present in short supply. It's not very abundant in that environment. And the, uh, uh, the effect of competition is that there is a suppression as the two species, they struggle for limited resources, so they both suffer from having that resource being very limited and not very available. And so there's a negative-negative interaction for two organisms, two or more organisms. Here in the next slides, we will see a series of certain experiments done in the lab, and we're seeing, uh, looking at their results. Um, here, for example, we're looking at the effect of uh, competition in the soil environment. For example, we are monitoring the colony farming units per gram of soil uh, versus the time of E. coli. So Escherichia coli, which is a natural intestinal microflora in the guts of humans and mammals in general, uh, if it is introduced into sterile soil, soil with no competence, no competition, okay, we would see this dashed line in increasing until E. coli uh, numbers, they could rise up in numbers and become steady, of course, after a while because it, the nutrients would be also limited. 
after if the E. coli, same amount of E. coli is introduced into a non-sterile soil, we will tend to see a decline in the uh, uh, number of those microbes as they tend to become less competitive with other organisms who compete for the same organic material, for example. So uh, we see that uh, E. coli, they're not very good competitors when it comes to their relationship with other bacteria. In this uh, figure, the experiment was designed to uh, separately look at first the total bacterial count, the gram-negative bacteria, and from the gram-negative bacteria, they're going to look at the E. coli behavior and how does that affect their abundance. So the abundance is also uh, uh, referred to as the colony forming units per gram of soil. And if we monitor that with time, we could know that the total microflora remains steady. Okay, it remains steady over here. I'm sorry, it, it, the pen just jumped up. Uh, and so it's just it remains steady. If nutrients were added, there's also a slight increase, a slight increase in the uh, uh, in the abundance and the population of the total bacteria, there's not much evidence because not uh, not an evident increase because of the competition between larger groups of bacteria. With gram-negative bacteria, we see that they start to decline, but after the addition of a nutrient source, there's an also an increase, also not a whole lot of increase in in terms of. Uh, numbers of colony farming units. But if we're going to only look at uh, E. coli, okay, we tend to see that there's a sharp decline, the sharp decrease in this colony farming units of E. coli. Following the addition of a nutrient source, here we see that there's an increase in the population to a certain extent, and after the nutrients were depleted, the uh, graph goes back to decline again. And here we know that uh, E. coli, let's say, are less also less potent competitors uh, in the soil environment because their numbers quietly decline very quickly. That leads us to talk about the microbial growth curve and here for, let's say, the bacterial growth curve. And I want you to remember this slide very well as we look at the population, the number of population in, uh, on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we're looking at time. So if we have a, a flask full of uh, culture media, broth media, and we've introduced a number of bacteria to that fresh media, and we started with, for example, here. This is the first initial number of bacterial added. After a while, we note that the bacterial counts slightly drop. The bacterial counts slightly drop from the initial uh, amount, concentration. And this is called the lag phase. Okay? So the lag phase is here where, um, uh, like, let's see if it, we can just define it. Up here, let's say at this line, there's a lag phase where the numbers, they decline. <clears throat> this is called uh, the acclimatization phase also, where the cells are adjusting, adapting to the new environment. Then there's an exponential increase in the amount, in the population of the um, number of microbes or bacteria up to a certain level where we also note a stop in the increase of, um, this is called exponential phase. This is called the exponential phase here. And exponential phase mean doubling in amount of time. Each unit of time, we see the generation doubles. So that's where you could see an exponential growth in the population. But that doesn't stay forever. After a while, if the media is still the same, we, may know, we will start to notice that the bacterial population becomes steady. And that's where it's the stationary phase. This is the end of the stationary phase where bacteria are steady, indicating that the number of newly generated cells or divided cells is equal to the number of dying cells. The cells, they start to become old and they start to die off. 
but um, because uh, the number of newly dividing cells equals the number of uh, dying cells, the, f the figure here or the graph stays steady at the stationary phase. And this is called the stationary phase. After that, if no media is supplemented, no, we, could, we will start to notice the population decrease, to decrease. And this is called the death phase, okay? This is the final stage where bacterial cells start to die off. There's no replenishing of uh, the waste uh, of the nutrients or the buildup of waste that leads those cells to die more than to divide. So these are the four levels of the bacterial growth curve the lag phase, exponential phase, stationary phase, and the death phase, okay? Now, when we talk about the growth, the growth rate, so there's a, a relationship between mu, which is the growth rate, and the len uh, 2 over 2.303 times TD, which is the doubling time. Each organism has its own potential to grow at a specific rate, and that rate is also uh, uh, attributed to the doubling time. The doubling time is, de is defined as the time needed for a generation to double in number, and population to double. And so uh, that's how we could uh, calculate the growth rate of that um, organism. For example, and these two organisms are given how, what is the time required their growth and the number of cells that they can uh, on the y-axis their number of cells we could see if the bacteria is given a low substrate it will start to grow on a, a growth curve here specific of its own and at high substrate concentration bacteria will double in number so depending on the substrate concentration if the same bacteria here if it's given a low concentration of substrate it'll start to grow very slowly, but at high substrate concentration, those bacteria could enhance the growth rate, so the growth rate will be enhanced. And, uh, and so here we see that if we, again, looking at the growth rate, and then the, how growth rate is affected by the substrate concentration. As we note here, at low substrate concentration, the growth rate was very minimum because nutrients is needed for the microorganisms. As we increase the amount of substrate, there is a general trend of increase in the uh, growth rate. So the growth rate increases as the substrate or the nutrients are given to that organism. But this uh, amount of increase, we will start to notice that there is an increase in the uh, uh, growth rate until we could note a steady state here, a plateau where no matter how much substrate I'm adding to that microorganism, the microorganisms grows at a specific growth rate. And there, and here we would note that this is the new max. This is the maximum growth rate that that organisms cannot multiply, cannot grow any faster. Okay? And so here's the Ks, which we will uh, refer to in a while as the saturation constant. So growth rate here, the growth rate is also defined as the mu max, maximum growth, multiplied by the substrate, where we can start to know that uh, maximum growth, divided over the Ks, which is the saturation constant, plus the uh, uh, S, which is the substrate at which maximum growth was reached. And so to do that, so we would like to, to know that the maximum specific growth rate for an organism is uh, somehow related to the specific growth rate and the substrate concentration. S is the substrate concentration. Well, the Ks here, it is uh, defined as the saturation constant. And how can we define the saturation constant? It is the concentration, the substrate concentration, at which an organism grows at half of its maximum growth rate. So if this is the uh, maximum growth rate from here to up here, okay, up here, the half of the halfway is about here, okay. So as they can just rely my uh, pen here, 
and we can just know that the Ks, it is the substrate concentration at which mu max is half, is redu reduced in half. Okay, that's how we can uh, define mu max and Ks. And so different organisms, as we mentioned, they grow differently. So if we have two growth curves in this uh, figure here, one is the one showing the S-shape uh, format over here. This is strain A with, uh, with the mu max over here. This is the mu max for it. And for strain B, it is correlated with the other curve. This is if the other curve. And this is strain B. This is mu max for strain B. So this is mu max B. And this one here is mu max A. Okay, here is mu max B. So if we want to know what is a mu max, where is the Ks for A, we need to look at mu max A, divide it in half, and now take a look at, uh, uh, divide it in half, and then use it to draw a line on the x-axis and get the Ks, the saturation constant for A. As for uh, mu max B, which is this point here, this is point here represents mu max b. We take it in half, and then we draw the line, and this is the Ks for b, the other strain, strain b. So each one has different types of feeding, different types of uh, reproducing, and they are different because of the, also the doubling time, their ability to utilize nutrients. If we want to give, finally, if we want to give this correlation between the R-related and the K-related species, we see that strain A represents the R-related species, while strain B represents the K-related species. As for growth rate, the strain A is very rapid, while B is moderate. Uh, the substrate utilization in A is very nutrient demanding, requires high substrate in order to grow. While strain B is moder moderately nutrient demanding, uh, the uh, substrates are used uh, less efficiently in A, okay? And uh, the substrate diversity is usually simple. While in B, it's more, more efficient, utilization of the uh, carbon source or the substrate, and usually they rely on different types of sources, so the uh, substrates are diverse, they're complex, okay? And the population dynamics and their size in strain A, we notice that there's an explosive, explosive uh, type of growth, usually below their carrying capacity. And you note that these uh, strains usually have frequent recolonization at a specific site. Uh, while strain B, they live at, at or near their carrying capacity, so they're more uh, stable in the environment and they're more dominant in that way. So that's it for today's lecture. Thank you very much for listening.